you. Uh, one of the reasons I'm excited to be here is because it was here, sitting where you sat, that God radically changed my life. I came here uh, as a, a Christian, but not somebody who was completely living out their faith. And while I was here, God began to work in my life about what really was to be lived for, and he used a number of people to do that, counselors, he used Randy, he used other students, and God really changed the whole direction of my life while I was a camper. And so I've been praying that what God did for me, he'll do for you. Now, I do have one little issue that I've got to deal with, all right? <laughs> Last night, when, when Randy mentioned that I was a camper in the mid-90s, I saw a lot of heads turn around looking for some old man, all right? <laughs> all right, all right. The 90s weren't that long ago, okay? Now, I, I was a, a camper for the first time in uh, 1995. How many of you were alive in 1995? All right, at least a few of you were alive then. So, okay, it was a few years ago, and uh, 18 to be exact. It was 18 years ago. Uh, that I've sat where you sat. How many of you are first time here? This is your first time? All right. 18 years ago, I was sitting exactly where you were sitting, and I had no idea uh, what God was about to do in my life. And so I've been praying that what God did for me, He's going to do for you. Uh, you got to see my family last night a little bit, but just wanted to... Uh, let you know that the girl you saw last night yeah, was much more subdued. This is more my, uh, her normal uh, look. So <laughs> that's normal for Lena. She's a little crazy, so be careful when you're around her. And this is my little boy, Evan Daniel. And uh, he's cute. He will beg for food. And, uh, and he will smile at all the girls. So mm, I don't know how I did that. Takes talent. Some things haven't changed. Mm, some things haven't changed. There we go. I fixed that. <laughs> Last night, uh, Randy mentioned something about your time here. And that he desired for your time to be not just a time to grow musically, but for God to work in your life. And all of you have come for a reason. Some of you came because you want to grow musically. Some of you came because you've been here before and you know how amazing it is. Some of you came because a parent wanted you to be here or a friend told you, hey, you've got to come to this camp. But I believe that whatever your reason for coming is that God desires to encounter your life. And that's what I've been praying for you, that while you're here, whether it's one week or two weeks or three weeks or four, that while you're here, that you will have an encounter with God that changes your life. I, I came here, uh, as Randy mentioned, my sister Amy had been here for three years and I just, you know, I had the opportunities to come but I just thought, I don't want to give up my summer for music camp. And then she said, well you know, there's about a hundred campers and she said 80 of them are girls and 20 of them are guys. And I thought, you know, maybe I should try this camp out. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll give it a shot. And so I signed up and I registered. And I, and I think they sent like the rules, you know, before you came. And, and I got a little scared, you know. I thought, this is going to be tough. How many of you thought that? Anybody? All right. All right, I guess I was the only one. We don't send them the rules anymore. Oh, you don't send them the rules anymore. Oh, very well. And so I wasn't sure what to expect. But like I said earlier, God changed my life radically. And I believe he wants to, to uh, intersect your life powerfully while you're here. One of the great things about being here is you're away from the distractions of everyday life. You know, because life is filled with distractions. And while you're here and you're unplugged, how many of you are having texting withdrawal? Anybody? All right. Anybody just randomly start? Yeah, all right. It'll get better in about three or four days. But while you're away from the distractions of life, it's an opportunity for you to hear from God in ways that we sometimes don't. And a lot of people have been praying for you. I've been praying for you, your counselors have been praying for you, the staff has been praying for you. I couldn't pray for you by name, but I, Saturday night I prayed for you by zip code. Uh, I went on the uh, share a ride and I prayed through your zip codes. And I did notice that there was someone from Swedesboro, is that correct? Where are you? Somebody? That's awesome. I grew up about 10 miles from there. And somebody from Deptford or Woodbury, thank you in the back. Very cool. Those are the most special people because those are the two people who grew up closest to where I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> While you're here, whether you're a camper, faculty member, counselor, 
my heart for you this week, this next two weeks, however long you're here, is that you will encounter God in such a way that you see him for who he is and that you have a desire to live for his glory and for his purpose. We're going to talk about living for the glory of God. And living for the glory of God begins by having an encounter with God. Um, if you're wondering what I look like back in 1995, that's it. I know, it's pretty pitiful. So, oops, I did that again. Did that again. We'll fix that. But here's what, here's what I've been praying for you, is that you'll have an encounter with God that changes the direction of your life. As you look in the Bible, there's all kinds of stories about people who God encountered and they were radically changed. I think about Noah. Noah had an encounter with God and he built a huge boat and saved the human race. Abraham had an encounter with God and he left his land and followed God and God gave him a son in his old age and that son had more children and they became a great nation through which Jesus came. Jacob had an encounter with God. Remember he wrestled with God and he was never the same. He walked with a limp the rest of his life. Moses had an encounter with God more than once. He came off the mountain and his face shone with the glory and the radiance of God. Samuel had an encounter with God. God called him by name at night. Elijah had an encounter with God. He heard him in a still small voice. Isaiah had an encounter with God. God gave him a vision of his throne room in heaven. You can read about it in Isaiah chapter 6. Jonah had an encounter with God in the belly of a fish. And Peter had an encounter with God on the shore of the Sea of Galilee after he had messed up really bad. And Jesus forgave him and restored him and called him to preach the gospel. John had an encounter with God on the island of Patmos in his old age. He saw Jesus in all of his glory. Paul had an encounter with God on the road to Damascus. The Bible's filled with stories of God encountering his people. And that's what I'm praying for you. That God will encounter your life in such a way that you are not the same person when you leave here. Whether it's a week from now or two or three or four. And it will be different. All of these people that God encountered, all their stories were different. The way that God interacted with them, the way that God spoke to them was different. But one thing that was the same was that their lives were changed forever by the encounter that they had with God. And that's what happened to me when I was here. And that's what I'm praying will happen in your life. When you have an encounter with God, it changes you and it changes the direction of his life. If you have your Bible this morning, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. We're going to use that as our, our theme verse for the next couple of weeks. And I know there's several of you that are only planning on staying one week, but I'm hoping that you'll do what I did when I came, and that was extend your time. You see, I came, I signed up for two weeks because that was like the minimum back then. I don't think that, you didn't let you sign up for one week back then. And I signed up for two weeks, and after about four days, I called home and said, can I stay for two more weeks? And I did, and I'm thankful for that. But this is going to be our theme verse. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It says, So whether you eat or whether you drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now a little context here. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. And there were Christians there who had accepted Christ as their Savior, but they really weren't getting the bigger picture about what the Christian life was to be about. Because the church in Corinth was filled with people who, although had accepted Christ as their Savior, were not living for the glory of God. They weren't living for what Christ had saved them to live for. And so Paul wrote to them to rebuke them, to challenge them, to encourage them, and to deal with some of their issues. And he sort of summarizes things here in chapter 10, verse 31. He says, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Life is about the glory of God. The greatest thing that you can do in life is to live for the glory of God. The greatest thing that you could ever do in life is to live for the glory of God. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning and all this week and next week is how do we do that? How do we live for the glory of God? God is the center of all that exists. His splendor, His majesty, His praise, that He is worthy of is His glory. And you know, you think about it, all of creation points to the glory of God, doesn't it? 
Paul said in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, he says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. The greatest thing that you can do in life is to live for the glory of God. Look at what it says there. It says, for from him, God created everything. Everything that you see, everything that we see around us, God created and God made. And not only did God create it, but he sustains it. Look, it says it's, for, it's not only from him, but it's through him. This universe is sustained by the power of God. And it's a massive universe. You know, if we think about it, this earth that we live on, it's not even a speck on the radar of this universe. Did you know that? The sun, as massive as it is, is not even a speck on the radar of the universe. Our galaxy is barely a speck on the radar of the universe. And check this out. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25. It says, To whom then will you compare me? Oops, got ahead of myself. <laughs> I'm coming back to that. <laughs> to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? Who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one of them is missing. Isaiah the prophet is talking about the stars that we see. And he says, he says this. He says, look at all of them. He says, God brings out their host by number and he calls them by name. There are billions and billions and billions of stars. Named every one of them. One of the things that impacted me when I was a student was at a bonfire, Randy made a statement. And he said, how big is your God? And I had never thought about that. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12. Backing up a little bit in that passage. Isaiah says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? Now think about that. It says he marks off the heavens with a span of his hands. So this incredibly vast universe that's filled with billions and billions and billions of stars, millions and millions and millions of light years. And it says God can take his hand and measure it. That's how big God is. His glory and His splendor and His greatness are what He calls us to live for. And isn't that awesome? Because think about, I mean, if, if the earth is so tiny, how small are we? How insignificant are we in the scope of the universe? And yet God gives an invitation to you to live for His glory. Now, I want to back up because you're probably wondering about this picture. Um, the reason I put that picture up there is because last August I had the opportunity to go to Peru and spend a week in the Amazon and we went came and hunting and this poor little guy ended up as our victim. But the cool thing about that was uh, I got to go out in this little dugout canoe thing with another guy from our church and we uh, negotiated with some villagers and they took us out came and hunting and the way you negotiate with villagers is with money. Um, so we went out and we were you know, just out in the Amazon in the middle of the night, and I looked up, and I had never, ever in my life seen that many stars. Away, miles and miles and miles from any light source, crystal clear sky, and the stars literally touched each other. And it was an overwhelming moment for me as I just sat back and looked up at the sky and just thought about how vast the universe is and yet God has named every one of those stars. It says in Psalm 19 uh, verse 1 and 2, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. The creation itself points to the glory of God, to the splendor of God. And Paul says whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. We are called as followers of Christ to live for the glory of God. That's what life is about. Life is about bringing glory and honor to the Creator, to the one who made you, to the one who has sent His Son to redeem you and to save you. He calls us to live a life 
for his glory. You know, within each of us, there's a desire for significance. We want to know that we matter. We want to know that our, that our time here matters. We want to make a difference with our life. How many of you want to find significance? How many of you want to live a life that matters? All right, I would hope you would raise your hand. All right, not too many people say, I just hope I can waste my life. I, I hope I can throw my life away. Nobody says that. But so many times we search for significance and meaning in the wrong places, don't we? People search for significance all over the place. Sometimes it's success, fame, power, money, music, sex, food. A host of activities that people search for significance and meaning. And the search always comes up empty. Because all those things don't fulfill us. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. I also think he was the stupidest man that ever lived. He was wise because one day God said, I'll give you anything that you ask for. And Solomon asked for wisdom and God gave it to him. But Solomon didn't always use his wisdom. He made a lot of poor choices and he followed a lot of empty pursuits. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, he writes about those pursuits. And he writes about what he chased after in life. And he writes about the emptiness that it brought him. I mean, Solomon had it all. In his day, in his age, he was the most powerful king in the world. Nation upon nation would bring him honor and tribute. If you power would bring success and significance and meaning in life, then Solomon would have found it there. No one was more powerful. No one was more wealthy than Solomon. He was ridiculously wealthy. He had power. He had wealth. Whatever he wanted, he had. If he wanted music, he just hired the orchestra of the band. Everything he wanted. Women, you all know about the women, right? He tried that. He tried wine. He tried agriculture. He tried everything. And he said everything was empty. Everything left him unfulfilled. He said it was vanity. It was meaningless. It was empty. But here's what he said in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. He said, here's my conclusion. And here's where God's wisdom guided him. He says, the, this is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man he says trust me I've tried it all I've experienced it all if you think you can experience it I have and it's empty so here's the conclusion here's what I want you to get he says fear God reverence him honor him live for his glory and keep his commandments follow his ways this is the whole duty of man God created you he made you. You are made in the image of God. You bear the likeness of your Creator. Every one of you. But every one of us has rebelled against our Creator as well. Ever since Adam and Eve rebelled, we have been rebelling against God. And that's why God in His mercy and His grace sent Jesus Christ to this world. He sent Jesus to live the life that you and I can't live. There's one thing I know about you. You're not perfect. You are not perfect. I'm not perfect. There isn't a perfect human being, is there? The Bible says what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means we missed the mark. We didn't even hit the target. We've all fallen short. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Separation from God. That's what we deserve. That's what we earn. But God in His love and His grace and His mercy sent His Son to bridge the gap of our rebellion. Jesus came and when He lived on this earth, He lived the life that you couldn't live. He lived a perfect life without sin. He lived the life that God intended for all of us to live, but we rebelled against Him. Jesus lived that life for you. He died the death that you deserve to die. He died as a criminal. He died... Bearing your sin and my sin, even though he was innocent and perfect. He did so willingly because he loves you. God gave his son for you. You saw the picture of my little boy up there. Now, I love and care about all of you. And even though I don't know all of you yet, I really do love you. I've been praying for you. And I would do anything for you. And if there was danger, I'd put myself in, in the way of that danger to protect your life. But I wouldn't give up my son for any of you. Just let you know, okay? So if it comes down to it, I'm saving my son. But God didn't make that choice. He said, I will give my son. And he gave his son for you. Willingly. Knowing that it would mean that he would pour his wrath, his judgment, his fury for sin upon his son. 
Jesus took on that role willingly, knowing that he would bear a pain far greater than nails, far greater than a crown of thorns, that he would bear the pain and the weight and the guilt of your sin. But he did that because he loves you. And he wanted to redeem you. He wanted to call you out of a worthless existence and a meaningless existence. He wanted to call you back from the rebellion that you're in and call you to a relationship with Himself where you could know Him and experience Him in your life and where you could live for His glory and where you could live for something significant. This world is temporary. Life on this planet is brief. I know when you're young, it feels like you have forever. Trust me, it feels like yesterday that I was sitting where you were sitting. All right? And then I blinked, and now I'm 35. It goes by way quicker than you think. But in the brief time that we have here, God says you have the opportunity to live for something significant. You have the opportunity to live for something that matters, and that's my glory. Life is about the glory of God. Romans 11.36 says, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. You've been called to live for the glory of God. That's God's will for your life. You know, a lot of times we, we wonder, what, what is God's will for my life? What is it that God wants me to do? And it's real simple. It's real simple. God wants you to live for His glory. He wants you to live for His kingdom purposes. He wants you to live for what matters. Paul said, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. God is a glorious God. His creation points to His glory. His love in sending His Son Jesus to die for you points to His glory and His grace. And God is calling you to know Him, to experience Him, and to live for His glory. And there's nothing, nothing that's greater to live for. I want to promise you that. When I was here, probably the most significant thing that happened to me happened at the bonfire. And while I was there, and I can tell you exactly where I was sitting, at, well, I guess it's Karn University now, 1995, and I distinctly remember feeling that God was calling me to ministry, to preach. Now, you've got to know something about me. I was not a likely candidate. And as I sat there hearing that call, I thought, God, you, you know how I talk at school. You know the kind of life I lived. I've kind of lived a double life. I go to church on Sunday, and I'm a pretty good person at home, but I'm not really that good of a person. God, you know I don't like to get up in front of people. <laughs> And so for three years, I wrestled with that call. For three years, I wrestled with that call. And I thought, no, I, I don't know if I really want to do this or not. And I struggled. And I want you to know those three years were some tough times. Because I thought, you know, maybe living for my own pursuits, maybe living for what I want to do will be better. And God had to remind me over and over again that life is about His glory and not mine. And life is about pursuing what He has for me and not my dreams. And God was calling me to exchange my plans for His plans. I made that choice finally, a few years later, to say, God, okay, you can have my life. It was in 1998, August. That there was a peace that came that was incredible. And I want you to know you can trust God. Because sometimes it's scary to say, God, you can have my life, right? You're like, well, what's he going to do? Where's he going to take me? What's it, what's it going to mean? Am I going to be single forever, right? Am I have to go to Africa or whatever? Hey, I'd love to go to Africa, all right? I've already had my shots, you know, I'm ready to go. <laughs> God's plans are infinitely greater than your own plans. And what he calls you to live for is infinitely greater than anything else there is to live for. Over this next week and, and into the following, we're going to practically sort of break down what does it take to live for the glory of God? What does it look like? Because you have to live for the glory of God in everyday life. I want you to know, it's easy to live for the glory of God while you're here. This is an amazing place. But when you go home, it's a lot harder. In everyday life, in a real world, in a world that's in rebellion against God, 
God calls you to live differently and to live for His glory. And so we're going to look in God's Word over these next few days about how we can practically live for the glory of God because God can and will enable you to live for His glory. I want to ask you for a very specific response this morning. I want to ask you to just take a moment in prayer in just a minute. And I want to ask you to, to pray this. I want you to say, God, while I'm here, whether it's one week or two or three or four, God, would you encounter my life in such a way that I see you for who you are and that my life is changed forever? Now, you might, be, you might be here this morning and you might say, you know, I'm not even sure about this Jesus thing. I'm not even sure he's real or that he's the only way to God. And if that's you, here's what I want you to pray this morning. Just say, God... If you're really real, if you're really who you claim to be, help me to see you this week. And for those of you that know Jesus as your Savior, here's what I'm asking you to pray. God, help me to see you in a greater way than I've ever seen you before. And God, would you encounter me? Would you meet me this week, next week, while I'm here? And God, would you change the direction of my life? Would you have your way? Would you bow your heads this morning? I just want to ask you to, to pray that prayer. I'm going to pray for you, but while I pray for you, would you pray that this morning? Would you say, God, would you encounter me? Would you meet me? Help me to see you. And God, whatever you want to do, God, I'm available. I'm open. Change my life if you want. Father, I just pray for each person here this morning. I thank you for them. I thank you that you've brought them here to this place. Father, I know that, that we all had different reasons and motivations for coming. But Father, I believe you brought all of us here for one reason, and that's to encounter you. And Father, I pray that you would help every one of us, from me to each person here, to have a fresh encounter with you, to meet you, to experience you, to see you. And Father, may your will be accomplished in our lives. Father, change our lives for your glory. Help us to see what really matters. And Father, help us to leave the worthless pursuits of this life and to chase after you and your glory and to pursue you with all of our heart, our mind, and our strength. Father, we love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.